text this morning, the first one found in Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22, beginning in verse 22, and I'll read down through the end of that chapter, well, down through verse 30, and then we'll turn over to Romans chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 22, or 23, excuse me, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her that thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes for my Sabbaths, and I have profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dowed them with the untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. And then turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 13. <coughs> Romans, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Let every soul be subject <coughs> unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Wherefore, or what, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace, and watch care over us. I ask, Father, that you would be with each of us today and open up our hearts, ears, and minds to be open and receptive to thy word. Father, may you use this message in a way that is right and pleasing in thy sight. May you give me the ability to preach your word in truth and in love. Father, if there are any here today that are lost, that know you not as Savior, I pray that this would be the day of salvation. They come to know you in the full pardon and forgiveness of sin. I ask more that you forgive us of our sins. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. My text, or my, my subject, comes from the text in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. And stand in the gap. And so the subject this morning is, will you stand in the gap? Will you stand in the gap? Just over a month ago, just over, I preached a sermon titled, Faith Over Fear, in light of the coronavirus. And so much has changed in those little over four weeks from the time that the Lord had me to preach that message until now. I have then not preached about it since then, and now God has allowed me to think through this as I... I've been studying through the book of Ezekiel and seeing so much of Ezekiel coming to light today in the U.S. I can find no other sermon to preach but this. 
Beloved, I'm going to be extremely direct today, and this message will not follow normal protocol. It will not have pretty matching letters between the subpoints. You won't be able to, to use one letter. But this message, I feel very strongly that I must preach, and I tried to get away from this message, but it one that God would not allow me to do so. In the message that I preached about a month ago, I encourage everyone to listen to the messages that I've been preaching on Wednesday nights in the book of Ezekiel. And it would shock you how close that this pandemic, as we call it, what is going on today to what the judgments were in Ezekiel's prophecy. It would, it would really open your mind. You would be surprised, I think, to see how similar what Ezekiel prophesied and spoke to the nation of Israel about. How close it is to what we're going through today in America. For years, beloved preachers have preached about being careful that persecution will come. And we have asked the question, will you stand up and stand up for Jesus? But it sounds like the only standing that would be done is if the gunman were to come into the church house. Then we would say, we are being persecuted. Well, persecution has come, and I'm going to preach about it, but I ask that you be patient as I explain. And I ask the question that we will dive into deeper in the book of Ezekiel, who will stand in the gap? Who will continue to stand in the gap? And when I say who, I'm not talking about the World Health Organization, not that who. <laughs> who among us? Not just Grace Baptist Church. And I'm not talking about the CDC, as they are both liberal socialist organizations that are gaining lots of control. It's the WHO and the CDC that continue to give recommendations to the doctors, to, to our governor's doctor, or, or whoever the Amy Acton is, and to that facility guy for fairly newly, I don't know, beside that guy, Trump's that doctor. They continue to give all of that counsel to these liberals. And slowly but surely, they've been taking away our liberties and our freedom, and, and no one really seems to care. There's been a few quiet-type protests that have happened in the last week or so, and there are a few businesses that I'm now reading are, are beginning to file lawsuits against the government on how unconstitutional it was that they shut them down and how quickly they did it. But by and large... Christian and non-Christian alike don't really seem to care. Over a month ago when I preached, many of our sound churches or our same churches have, have shut down before March 15 when I preached that message, Faith Over Fear, and are still today shut down. That's over five to six weeks without the Word of God coming forth from the house of God. And yes, it's been replaced with virtual things. And yes, it's been replaced with streaming. But that is no replacement for the house of God. It is no replacement. Streaming. I'll try to stick to the notes. How long will they allow a recommendation, not a mandate? Please understand there's a difference between a recommendation and a mandate. Not that the mandate would stop me, but of what our governor has said. How long? And I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm not trying to be a jerk. How long will we stay away from the house of the Lord? When I preach this, again, I'm not trying to be prideful. I'll say that a couple of times. But I personally do not want to allow a government that has no business in local church affairs to keep me, to keep us from serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Back in December. December. I said that the government created a problem to solve a problem. And that's bad, beloved. <laughs> I want you to know that's not a good thing. And now that's what's coming to light. Now that's what's coming to light, that, that the laboratory, or one of the laboratories over, on, over there in Wuhan, uh, created this, I, I use the word created, but they designed this 
COVID-19 to see how the government could control it. And don't think for a second that a communist country like China would care about losing thousands of people because they don't. It doesn't phase a communist government. It didn't phase Hitler when he killed off the Jews. It doesn't phase a communist government. This morning I'm going to address some of what I just covered in this introduction and so much more. So get ready, <laughs> hold on tight, and pray for me that I would stay unemotional. Sometimes that's not such a bad thing to get into the message and that I will stay in the gap and continue to preach the messages as God gives them to me. I have three parts to the message. First of all, I want to ask the question or answer the question, is the church owned by the government? Secondly, is this judgment upon our freedoms and to Christians? And then thirdly, and the most exciting part of the message, that we are God's people and we are messengers of life. Amen. We are messengers of life. I want to address the subject that has been coming up uh, and asked of me a lot, uh, not only from our own uh, Baptist, not anybody here, so understand that this question has not stemmed from anybody, any of the members of Grace Baptist Church. I want you to know that, but some of my Baptist brethren have asked this, and many people at work have asked me this question about the church and government. Well, the simple answer that I want to give when I ask, or when I ask you the question, is the church owned by the government, the simple answer is no. No, it's not. No matter what the state or government says, they do not own the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the house of God. And this house of God does not belong to Caesar. It belongs to Jesus Christ. That's who this house belongs to. Ronald Reagan, one of our most loved presidents in the United States, one of the most loved, not just Justin Myers saying, I wasn't even old enough to really enjoy the, the, the Reagan regime. Okay? But I know enough to know that he was one of the most loved presidents of the United States. I have a ton of quotes. I'm going to give you three of his quotes. He said some pretty interesting things. As a president, as a politician. Freedom, he said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be, so it must be protected and handed on for them to do the same. Did you, did you catch that? Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And if you don't think some of your freedoms and my freedoms have been stripped away in the last four or five weeks, you're very, very wrong. <laughs> We must continue to fight for our freedoms. Another Reagan quote was, Concentrated power has always been the enemy of liberty. Concentrated power has always been the enemy of liberty. Look in the Bible. Go back to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had concentrated power. Concentrated power. And it took away from the people's liberty. What Nebuchadnezzar said, the people did, except for a few, Shadrach, Meshach, you know, Abednego, all of them, right? We could go through those examples. A lot of the wicked kings that are up on our board there, concentrated power. A lot of these doctors, and the names that I don't pronounce very, very well, and I don't mean to, to be light or to make fun of that, their names or anything like that, have a ton of concentrated power. Governors taking over concentrated power. And it's stripping away liberties. One of his most famous quotes, and I'm sure it's one that you thought I would bring for sure. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Now, I'm not anti-government. I'm just anti-socialist, anti-communist. I understand that we need, I, I'm thankful for a lot of, I'm thankful that you know, um, if someone breaks into my house, I can call the law and they're going to, you know, take justice and things like that, right? So you understand, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I preached about, or I already read the, the scriptures about rendering, unto, um, you know, our tribute where tribute is due and all of that, and I'll even talk about that more. 
But I said back in December that the government has uh, made a problem and now they have stepped in to solve it. Oh, they've stepped in to solve it and, and oh, it's so good they have because we don't know how to think for ourselves. We Americans, we've lost that ability. We don't know how to think. It's a good thing we got somebody thinking for us. Here, let me give you, let me give you money. That's what's going to help. Let me make sure that unemployment, you can get to that very easily. There's no waiting period. And let me, let me not just give you 40% of what, uh, you know, let me, let me make sure you get more. Good thing about the stimulus is that we can give more money to the Lord in his house and for the work of the Lord. So that was, that was nice. Make a problem so they can solve a problem. Okay. They've done everything to make us trust them. They've given us money. They've told us where to go and how to shop. They've told us, don't leave your house. Don't travel around the state. And you better not leave the state unless it's deemed essential. Is the cry of almost every governor in our union. And so many have thought for years that government control would come in the form of of guns and black uniforms. And that, that's, the, that's the persecution that we said, we will stand up for that. But we talked about in Sunday school, would you? Would you stand up for that kind of persecution? Would you stand in the gap and continue to preach the gospel? That's what the, the third part of the message is about, so I'll get there. Well, this persecution hasn't come in the form of guns and black uniforms. This persecution has come in the form of science and stethoscopes. That's how this one's come. Science and stethoscopes. And, and, and churches are being persecuted, and I have facts about that. This is tyranny that we are now facing. These in our government are now doing what we have been warned about. They are holding a population under maximum control, and we have allowed them to do it. With no fight, no problem. You know what's best. You know what's best. Back to my question. Is the church owned by the government? We are not. Now, yes, we are to do what the Bible tells us to do. Romans 13, 7. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. Absolutely, our Lord taught us this, but... I will tell you, as I already said, this church does not belong to Caesar. In, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21, absolutely pay your taxes, folks. They say unto him, Caesar, they, they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the thing which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So I'm not doubting that. But that does not give the state control of our churches. As I said a moment ago, a long moment ago, our churches belong to the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ruler of this church. And our founding fathers, watch this, our founding fathers, to make sure that that right was protected, had this to say about it in the First Amendment. And I will read it to you. Now, understand that I'm going to give you scriptures that God already said it before the Founding Fathers, amen, that this is our right to be able to assemble. The Founding Fathers said this, and I want you to be educated of these things. I want you to understand why we're still meeting. I want you to know these things. Here's what it says in the First Amendment. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution prevents the government from making laws which regulate any establishment of religion. Let me read that again. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution prevents the government from making laws which regulate any establishment of religion. Watch, it goes on. Prohibit the free exercise religion of religion or abridge the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the right to peaceably assemble or the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. And redress means the right to give grievances. Our founding fathers wrote that in the First Amendment. And we have just sat back and said, DeWine knows best. DeWine knows best. Listen to DeWine. Right? 
And he's taking advice from Amy Acton, liberal doctor, who's taking advice from that, that other doctor guy to strike fear into every one of our minds. Fear is powerful. Fear is powerful. And God has equipped us with, with you know, fear, right? So if, if I go and, and stick a knife into a 110, I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to fear I'm going to be shocked, right? If I put it into a 220, I'm going to be shocked even more, and that's as high as my electrical knowledge goes, so I'll stop with 220. So I have a fear of sticking a knife into the socket. Not a whole lot of socket knife electrical deaths, but yet we still fear that. God has equipped us with fear, right? We have been taught that, that sharks are vicious man-eating animals, and, and the percentage of, of people... You know, being bitten and eaten by a shark is extraordinarily low, less than a percent. And yet we still have a fear of sharks, right? So it's not hard to build in a mechanism of fear. Okay? Now, long before our founders wrote that constitutional right in well, that amendment there, God has already spoken. Right? That amendment that I read, though, means that the state has no right to stop us from peaceable worship. But again, before the founding fathers had anything to say about it, God already did. Where he said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. And Romans, and I won't reread it, but Romans 13, 1 through 3, that was part of our text. Romans 10, 25 says... <laughs> Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I'm going to talk about the judgment that I believe that we very well could be under, and we preached Hebrews 10.25. From the moment the Lord called me to preach, and the moment I've been in the Lord's churches, we have heard that we are not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And the manner is a lot of forsaking it. A ton! God told us not to do that. Now, have we shut down before because of a snow day? We have. We, this church body has said, you know what? I can't make it out. I'm not going to be able to make it out. And I've made a decision and said, let's cancel. Ten years ago, we had a stomach bug flu that went through this church. And we're like, you know what? Let's chill out for a Wednesday and let's go ahead and cancel that. Right? Have we done that as a local authoritative body? We have. But as I said, there are some churches that are on their fifth and sixth week of no services and are probably going to go to seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. How hard is it for you to come back to the house of the Lord when you miss a service? Maybe not as hard. You miss two, it's harder. You miss three weeks, it's even harder. And if for some reason you've missed a fourth week of church, coming back is like, why? Now, I've been told, not by anybody here, again, this is not directed here, I just want you to have some different wisdom, some different understanding. I've been told that I am breaking the law. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. By asking or by holding the services, I'm not breaking the law. One, the Constitution says that it prevents the government from making laws which regulate any establishment of religion and prohibit the free exercise of religion and that we have the right to peaceably assemble. I got that going for me. Number two, on page about 13 or 14 of the 28-page uh, PDF that was sent out by DeWine when he put the stay-at-home order, in there, and I found it, there is an exemption for religious organizations. Now, his recommendation for 10 and under not to assemble is certainly there, but it's there. It's there. We're allowed. But even if he said we weren't, would we still? We talked about that persecution again earlier. Would we still, would we stand in the gap and continue to preach Christ? Now, I'm not holding services because I want to be prideful. But I've always said, and I, I've always said I believe this verse, and I still do today, and that's Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. I mean, this has been part of my, my ministry. This has been part of what God has called me to do. And in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, the word of the Lord says this. 
Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter was being persecuted for preaching the gospel. And he said, well, I'm going to obey God rather than men. Are we willing to stand the gap today and obey God rather than men? Peter again was put on trial for preaching that gospel. We've always said that if it came down to it, that we would go down preaching the gospel at all costs, even if it meant our lives would be at stake. I, I haven't seen that. All I have seen is government-induced and media-influenced fear. And let me just ask another question for the Christian and the non-Christian alike. Why all of a sudden are we trusting the media? <laughs> like, do we think that they just all of a sudden are going to be honest? Now, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I'm just saying, we have always cried, fake news, fake news, fake news. The media is blowing it out of proportion. Do you think that they're doing it now? Yes! Why do you think Super Bowl commercials are so expensive? Because millions of people watch. And right now, they have more viewers, media outlets, than they have ever had. People are glued to the TV 24-7, and I'm telling you what, they can charge premium prices for advertisement. And you don't think for a second that that doesn't influence them? Listen, I lived in Florida most of my, well, a lot of my life, two different sections of my life. And every time there was a tropical disturbance, it was the one that was going to wipe Florida off of the map. Every time. Every time there was a tropical disturbance, that was the one that was going to take Florida out. Why? so that we would have to watch it develop for the next six, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten days, or however long, so that we could be sucked in, and then they could pay those, you know, then they could charge the advertisers more because we're watching. So don't think all of a sudden the media got a heart and that they're doing it right. Because they didn't. They didn't. They're not telling us all the truth right now. Why would they? They're playing into fear, and it's working. Well, anyway, I digress. <laughs> I said it earlier in the message, I want to make sure you all understand I'm not anti-government, but as I said, I am anti-socialism and anti-communism. And that's what this man-made fire is, COVID-19 has done over there from Wuhan, China. It has allowed rulers and doctors to do what Reagan warned us about. Remember, his warning was, concentrated power has always been the enemy of liberty. So it's allowed these doctors and these governors to have a concentrated power, and it is the enemy of liberty. They're making me feel bad for assembling. Pastors are being told, if someone in your congregation gets COVID-19, their blood is upon your hand. Your blood is upon your hands. How are you going to deal with that? CDC is making us feel bad for not wearing a mask. We feel bad if we cough, if we sneeze, if we look at someone. If we extend our hand and handshake, we're the enemy. I preached a month ago. And how much more do you feel awkward out in public now? We do. We feel worse. So let me address the blood on my hands comment. Am I a bad pastor for still holding services? Keeping in mind, I've not forced anyone to come. But let me break this down for a moment. In 2019, that's last year, 800, 840,768 people in the U.S. died from heart disease. 840,000 plus people in the U.S. last year died from heart disease. Am I a bad pastor, and I'm not being flippant, for allowing you to eat what you want? Am I wrong for allowing foods to come down there that may lead to heart disease? Now, yes, I have responsibility on how we're to be healthy. And I preach that the Bible tells us that we are to you know, um, abstain, you know, from uh, gluttony and things like that. I have a responsibility in doing that. In 2016, an estimated 1.6 million deaths 
were directly caused by diabetes. 1.6 million deaths. Has big government come in and shut down all factories that make sugary food and drinks? Do you, you ready for them to do that? They're doing it now. They're shutting down factories that they feel are non-essential. They're absolutely doing it now. In 2019, it is estimated that over 38,000 Americans lost their lives in car crashes. And so, am I wrong for allowing you to drive to the house of the Lord? Um, am I? The media and our governments have done an amazing job with planting fear in our minds. We could be fearful of any of those things that I mentioned, but you still have the right to think. You have the right, if you want to go to the state fair, if we have them this year, to eat a whatever delicious cheese-filled fried food that you want. Eat the, eat the burger that has the glazed donut on the top and on the bottom with bacon and cheese. Eat the, <laughs> eat the, eat the Snickers that has been dumped in flour, egg mixture, and then dumped in grease and put it in your gut. You have the choice to do that. You have the choice to do that. You have the choice to do that even though over 840,000 people in this country die from heart disease every year. You have the choice to go to the store and buy Coke and, and buy you know, cakes and goodies and desserts even though over 1.6 million people die from diabetes every year. You have the freedom to get in your car and drive. Well, right now we're limited to where we can go. So far in the U.S., death from the coronavirus is 38,664. But that's not an awesome number. It's not a great number. I don't want any lives lost. You guys might think that I do, but I don't. But it's lower, though, than the average number of Americans that die every year from the flu. And so, and the flu deaths in America range anywhere from 40,000 to 60,000 every year. Somewhere in that range. 40,000 to 60,000 people die from the flu every year. And it was really easy to get us all indoors for the coronavirus. What are we going to do when we have a bad flu episode? We're going to shut it down? And that number that I gave you about the coronavirus is also a bit skewed. You know why? Because every time somebody dies, if they have the virus, if they have corona in their bloodstream, and let me also tell you this, scientifically, doctor fact, that the common cold has strands of the coronavirus in it. So every time somebody dies, if they have coronavirus, they've now died of coronavirus. Now, COVID-19 is different than corona. <clears throat> You're like, whoa, whoa, where'd you get your medical degree? I didn't get one. Corona, as I said, is even in the common cold. COVID-19 is the result of, of the um, extreme case of corona. But the statistic I gave you was people that died from corona, not COVID-19, right? So no, I don't have a medical degree by any means. I just need you to have some other perspective. Now I understand that this is real and I am not behind this pulpit saying that Corona is not real, that COVID-19 is not real and I know that people are dying. But I know that people are dying every day and that is from something that is called sin. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. We all have a death sentence. I could die today. I could die from heart disease. I could die from diabetes. I don't have the best diet. You all know it. I don't. But I could, I could leave here and the Lord could send an asteroid and, and it could strike me. I don't know how I'm going to die. But every single person born in this world is going to die. And again, I'm not trying to minimize the research. Do your own research. But not from the mainstream media. Listen to some Christian doctors. And you will find this is not as big of a pandemic as what our liberal rulers would have us to believe. 
And as I said, though, you know what? Yeah, be smart. Sure, wash your hands. Absolutely. If you're sick, stay home. If you're high risk, stay home. Be smart, for sure. Absolutely. But as we're being smart, also be smart to know that our rights are being taken away. Even in hospitals, right? So long we've been threatened with social medicine. And the government will decide, big, big government, they're so nice. They will decide what is necessary and what is not necessary. And do you know how many medical, now did you know this? Did you know that medical care workers are being let go? And they're also on unemployment? You say, nah, uh yes, sir. Yeah, those that are not deemed essential. Heather's friend, one of Heather's friends has been waiting for her gallbladder to be taken out for three weeks, but she can't yet because it is not critical enough. Right? It's on our doorstep. It's not on our doorstep. It's in. It came. All right, well, that's it. I'm not going to give you any more stats. I just want to let you know why we're still assembling. And that God has given us a great responsibility to preach the gospel. That'll be the third part of the message, and that's what we'll be doing. But I want to get to some of this back in Ezekiel. So is his judgment upon our freedoms and upon the Christians? Well, yes, I think it is. Of course. You know, obviously, you're thinking that. I, you're like, yeah, we got that down, Pastor. But give me a few minutes to explain and then think it through yourself. Now, I'm not going to say that this is and what we're going through with this virus a judgment from God. But as I read in Ezekiel, I'm a bit more convinced that it could be. Week after week, we've been going through Ezekiel, and we've been seeing this. Well, I want to go back to a portion in the book of Ezekiel that I preached on Wednesday night, back there in Ezekiel chapter 22, and uh, verses 17 and 18, and, and it's talking about the judgment. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become a dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you are become dross, behold, therefore I will gather unto you uh, unto the midst of Jerusalem. All right? So, sorry, God is showing yet again here to the Israel, or, or here to Ezekiel, as Ezekiel is bringing the message to the Israelites. And, you need to understand that over and over again, God has been telling and showing Ezekiel the abominations that Israel and, the, and his own children have been committing, and that is who Israel is, God's chosen children. And God is, is using Ezekiel and showing Israel how far they've fallen away. Now, beloved, I can only imagine what would be written about the history of the U.S. But a lot of what Ezekiel has to say, I think, is written about us. He's saying that these Israelites are no longer silver. They are cast away. God has judged them and found them not to be pure. And it got me thinking that all of our works will be tried by fire one day. And I ask, how will your work stand up? And what happens to us as Christians when some heat is applied? And I would agree with you that some heat is being applied to us right now. We are currently going through a little heat. Not that total persecution that we talked about earlier, right, where, where they're coming in in black uniforms and guns, but I do believe that the persecution they're using is, as I said, science and stethoscopes, and I wasn't original in that. I heard that on a podcast somewhere. But be sure we're going through some heat right now for continuing to hold services. It's not looked upon very well. And every time somebody asks me about it, I feel like I have to defend why we're doing it. And now I don't want to have to feel like I have to defend. I want to defend why we're doing it. A lot of abortion clinics, not all of them, most of them are open. Small businesses closed, restaurants closed, sections of retailers in the state of North closed. You can't, and if you live in the state of Michigan, you can't go buy seeds, you can't go buy mulch, you can't go buy a big TV if you want to. You can't. Cut off. Their governor said, er, you can't do it. People are like, cool. Okay. Sermons are being analyzed, right, from all of the uh, streaming that's been going on and now being targeted as hate sermons. Churches in many states holding drive-in services are getting ticketed. Churches being told they're not allowed to assemble. What did I read to you? I read to you the First Amendment earlier. We're allowed. We're allowed. One pastor down in Mississippi was holding a drive-in service. Wasn't even letting them come in. Holding a drive-in service. People were in their cars. Turning to a radio station.
station where they were broadcasting. And the police showed up, prosecuted them, wrote tickets. That same pastor said, hey, let's go to Walmart and see what they would do. And they were allowed to shop at Walmart. Yeah, churches are being targeted. Absolutely. Our socialist Ben government has done it. They have turned Americans against each other, wearing masks, sneeze guards up. They ain't just going to come down, right? When, when is the magic time that the pandemic is over and no one has the flu and no one has corona and no one has a cold? Listen, if you're sick, love your neighbor. Stay home. If, 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 if you are one that is susceptible to sicknesses, I get it. Stay home. I don't want COVID. I don't want any of you to get COVID. I'm not running around saying that I want COVID. I don't. I don't want a cold. I don't want bronchitis. I don't want the flu. I mean, I moan. I'm a guy. I'm a whiner. It's what I do. And I don't want any of you to have it. And if I had the flu and if I had corona, I would stay home. Love your neighbor. Stay home. Sure. But our socialist government has turned Americans against each other. Wearing masks and sneeze guards up. And when this is over, and I use that term lightly, and if the Lord doesn't come back first, we as Americans are forever changed. The term social distancing is a term that's not going to go away. It's going to be a part of everyday life. Masks, sneeze guards, six feet away. That will be around for years and years, if not forever. I would say big events, ball games. We're going to, if they're allowed, they're going to have to sell probably every third seat. Restaurants. You can open again, but you better only service every other table. Amusement parks. You better limit what's coming in. You better put your mask on. See, we're no longer smart enough to think for ourselves when we should or should not go out in public. Everything that the older generation has warned us about is coming to pass here in the U.S. and the world. And I've said this before in this pan or this sickness, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it. We are here for such a time as this. And I'm about to get to the good news of the gospel. You've had to endure a lot, I understand. But we're here maybe also to fight for our country too. And I said it earlier when I talked about church closers. What would, what would happen if a church member, even in our own church, comes down with COVID-19? And I'm praying honestly, you might not think so, but I'm praying honestly that no one here does. But would I be blamed for the spread? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. One person at my work, if they hear that somebody here, you know, at our church, when they ask me every week if I held church, yes, I did. Oh, you did? Yes, I did. Well, does anybody there have COVID? If I were to say one time, I'm going to be blamed for that. Not, not the over a thousand of you that could be together at Walmart. Can't be from that. It's from the Christian church that decided to have services. Do you see where this is going? Do you see it? It's from the Christian church that decided to have services. Not from the liquor store that's still open. No. Can't be that. So how does our faith hold up with some heat, folks? One day our works again, they're going to be tried that way. They're going to be tried that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, i got plenty of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. May each of us, myself included, not back down and stand up, stand up for the Lord Jesus. Now, further on down in the text in Ezekiel, and I won't take you all the way through that now. I, I had a lot here, but you can read on how it was the priests, that is the preachers. You can read on how it was the false prophets, that was the false prophets. And you can read on how the princes, and I read it to you already in the text, they are the ones that led the people away from the teaching of the word of God. The preachers, the false prophets, and the rulers. And I personally don't want to stand before my Lord in judgment and be tried for leading God's people away from his word. Yeah. That is not something I'm willing to stand before my Lord and say. 
And so I personally want to stand in the gap and be counted faithful for preaching the gospel message. Verses 27 and 28 in Ezekiel were very challenging, very hard for me. I was very uncomfortable when I read that, that leaders back there in Ezekiel 22 were compromising for selfish gain. Politicians. We got those today. There were princes and leaders in their government in Ezekiel's day that sought to destroy the people to get what they want. No different today. <clears throat> the false prophets were getting their message from the world and not from the word. The priests were getting their message from the world and not from the word. I want to get my message from the word. And then verse 30 in that text, this was my, my subject, right? And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me uh, for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found Sounds a lot like Sodom and Gomorrah. No, no. They have a hundred righteous. No. Ninety. No. Well, I mean, it was higher. All the way down. All the way down. No. I will not destroy it. No. Are we going to continue to stand? All right. Thirdly and finally, we are, beloved, watch this. This is great. We are messengers of life. <laughs> and I want this to be the last part of the message because as children of God, we have always preached what? We have preached the message of life, <laughs> right? The life-changing message that brings us from death unto life. We have a living home. You know, I, I'm, I'm not personally afraid of COVID-19. Again, I don't want it, and I don't want it for any of you. But I don't fear it because we, we have a living hope. Turn, if you would, to the, first, the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I love these verses. Verses 3 through 5. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. And it, and it says here, Blessed be the Lord, or blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Isn't that awesome? We have a living, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have been preaching for years the message of life. The message of life. So my challenge to all of us, myself included, again, for years we preach about faith and life. And I've been excited. I get excited about preaching the gospel message. I get excited about preaching the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't change now. Amen. People need to see that we are not afraid of death. Everything that we've always said, we're still not afraid of death. I would rather not die <laughs> uh, until the Lord's time. I mean, there, I'm sorry, I meant to say that I... I can't wait you know, right? for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But there are certain ways that I'd rather not die. Some of you know some of my, my fears, right? But I know that no matter how the Lord takes me, that I am His and He is mine and I'm going to be with Him for all eternity. That's awesome. So don't, don't change from having a lively hope in Jesus Christ, no matter what. Right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, what do they do? They comfort me. Right? Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall know. Right? I don't have to fear. We have victory in Jesus. And I want you to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot save you, but Jesus can. Pray for revival. Pray that revival would spread like wildfire across this land. And the people be saved in the absolute Lord's church. So while we pray for America, we must also pray that God's people will stand up for what is right according to God's word. Pray that souls will be saved. And tell folks about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that all this stuff is going on. And knowing that the appearing of our Lord is near. We need to stand up for Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus saves. That's the message that we need to bring. If there's ever been a time that we should be telling folks about Jesus Christ, it's now. I believe judgment sure is coming. And I want people to know about my Savior that saves. And so as I close, beloved, I know these are challenging times. And, and, and I didn't preach, right, to, to change anyone's mind. I just wanted to give some other perspective. And as I said, when I stand before the Lord, I want to stand before the Lord knowing that I have done my due diligence. I've never preached anything like this before. Next week, we'll be back on our study of the centrality of the Word of God, the Lord willing. But for today, I pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and that God will use this message in a way that is right and pleasing in His sight and even for the salvation of a lost soul. Thank you for your attention to the Word of God, and shall we stand together and we'll be dismissed in prayer.